Great are you, Lord, indeed. Let's pray together. Lord God, you are great, and we do pour out our breath to praise you. We thank you that you've given us breath and life, and you've given us your love through Jesus, and you've given us your word, and we come now to it and ask you to speak to us, because we really need to hear what you have to say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story uh, about something that happened two days ago. Uh, Today is supposed to be the beginning of a brand new sermon series called Did God Say That? where we had planned to spend this summer, and we still will, looking at some of the things that we throw around as if they're Christian phrases, but we don't really understand what the Bible has to say about them. Things like, everything happens for a reason, which was supposed to be the subject today. Or things like, God won't give you more than you can handle, or, uh, you know, Christians should never judge, and these kinds of things. And uh, again, we're going to start that series next week, and here's why. On Friday morning, I got up and uh, worked, finished some of my notes on my sermon for Everything Happens for a Reason, and I sent off my sermon outline, emailed it uh, so that all the slides could be made that you see and they could get that in order. And then I went out to mow the lawn, put my ear pods in, was listening to a worship uh, uh, playlist, mowing the lawn. And I really felt God saying to me, I need to preach a different sermon. But I said to God, it's Friday. Uh, it's too late, Lord. You missed the window of opportunity. I'm already, I already emailed it off. If you'd only talk to me sooner, you know, as if God's going to listen to that. And as I went, mowed the law and listened to worship, I really felt the clear urging of God to preach a different message. Now, this is way out of the box for me and for us. I believe God can speak through our preparation and the Holy Spirit works through our plans ahead of time. I, we're not a last minute uh, group around here, but I, it was unavoidable. And so you could probably guess what happened in this wrestling match between me and God. By the time I finished mowing the lawn, God won. I came back inside, went downstairs to my little study and emailed uh, all the people that need to know and said, we're going to go a different direction. And they're so gracious and and, and made that adjustment with me. Um, So we're going to begin our series, Did God Say That, next week. This week, I want to talk to us, to my own heart, to your hearts, and to us as a church family, to all who are tuning in from wherever you are, from the New Testament book of James. Uh, James writes as a pastor to God's people spread around that region, and he speaks to us, the pastor's heart to us as well as God's people in the 21st century. Um, Once more, let me just ask God to speak to us through his word, because sometimes, Lord, your word is like a hammer, which breaks up hard ground in the hardness of our heart. Sometimes your word is like water, which soothes us and nourishes us and softens us. And sometimes your word is like a mirror, which gives us an accurate reflection. And sometimes your word is sweet like honey. And we just want to say that we welcome all of it. We want you to speak and tell us what you need to say. Amen. Okay, James chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 13 verses, the first half of this passage. James, again, speaking to the church. Uh, James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, He was the half-brother of Jesus, which is interesting. And by the way, if you don't know this, James, uh, early on, did not believe Jesus was the real deal. You know, you can imagine, my brother thinks that he's God. He he was a a, a skeptic, but he came to surrender his heart to Christ, and then he became an influential leader in the church in Jerusalem, where the church started. And then as it spread, he writes a letter, a general letter to the church spread around uh, the region, the Mediterranean region. And here's what he writes in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. 
because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, as I said, James was the leader of this church, and he writes, and I want you to keep in mind something about Christianity. Christianity, maybe some of you don't know this, or you're, you're not that up on your Christian history. Christianity, we think of it as a dominant world religion, but that's not how it started. It started as a small sect within Judaism. Now, Judaism, uh, that faith, the, Hebrew, the faith of the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, was itself uh, an outsider, a minority. They're occupied people in the, in the Roman Empire, and the Jewish faith was represented a a tiny uh, segment of that population. So the Jews themselves are on the outside. And then within Judaism pops up this little sect of people that follow Jesus, these Jesus people. So Christianity began as a minority within a minority, an outsider of outsiders. That's how it started. Uh, Even the Roman Empire, they didn't didn't even have a category for these people. They just called them people of the way or the Jesus ones. They didn't know what to call them even. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called The Inner Ring. It's a wonderful essay in in the collection of essays called The Weight of Glory. And in this essay, he says um, that of all the passions, the passions to be on the inside is the most skillful at making a man who is not yet very bad do very bad things. Until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain. His point, because of our own fears of being excluded, of being on the outside, we become very good at rejecting and excluding people. Out of our own fears and insecurities, we develop the skill of drawing these circles and these rings which keep people out. This is what began to happen in the early church. Because they were a group of outsiders, as the church spread, some of them began to align themselves, look for people in positions of power and influence uh, to, to align themselves with. And James is saying, you can't do this if you're going to be God's people. You can't show that kind of favoritism. Let me read verse one for you again. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. The way the Greek actually is constructed in his letter, he's saying it's a betrayal of Jesus if you act this way. Not just, hey, it's not a good idea. You should not do this. I I would not recommend it. But it actually cuts contrary to who Jesus is. It completely contradicts who Jesus is and how he lived. It doesn't look like him at all. It doesn't look like love at all. We just finished a seven-week series on what love is from 1 Corinthians 13. In a sense, he's saying, this is not what love looks like to behave this way. Now, the word for favoritism in Greek is an interesting word. It only shows up here in James this way in one other place in the New Testament. It shows up in no other Greek literature of the ancient world. Some scholars think it's a word that the Christians invented to try to communicate something here. It's the Greek word prosopolemptis. Hard to say, but what it simply, it's simply, it's a way of translating the Hebrew concept of partiality or favoritism. And the Hebrew concept literally meant to accept or to receive the face of someone. Those of you who know, the Hebrew is a language of pictures and images. And so to, to show partiality was to accept the face of someone. Do you see what James is communicating here? He's saying, some of you are saying, ah, what a face, this face. I love this face. Oh, not that face, not those faces. This face, not that face. That's what he's saying. You cannot behave this way and call yourself a a Christ follower. It doesn't have a place. Now, the Old Testament is full of references to the psalmists and others crying out, God, don't turn your face from me. God, don't turn your face away from me. Don't hide your face from me because the face of God was synonymous with the favor and blessing of God. We know this from Numbers chapter six, right? The the great priestly blessing, right? As we ask God to lift up his countenance to us, to turn his face toward us and be gracious to us, that's the symbol of God's blessing and his favor. And here James is saying, you're turning your face away from people and you can't do it. James gives them then a not so hypothetical situation in verses two through four. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Preferential treatment to people in positions of power 
in order to gain from their status, while at the same time rejecting, dismissing, ignoring, snubbing, sliding, or even oppressing those who are not in positions of power. That's what's going on. Now, I, I have to be honest, I always sort of assumed in my mind that, you know, favoritism is like when we say playing favorites. That it just meant, you know, I like some friends better than others. And that's not maybe the best thing, but it's not terrible. I mean, you know, the teacher's pet, people have favorites, you know. I know that maybe we shouldn't, but I, I always assume that, you know, you've got a group of friends that you, that you like, that you're favorites. We even know in Jesus' circle, there was the inner ring, right? Peter, James, and John were kind of his closest friends. So maybe even Jesus did a little bit. Not so. James is not talking about your friendship cliques, your inner group of friends. He's saying we tend to favor two groups of people in our, in, our, in our own nature, and we all do it. We tend to favor those that are like us and those that are powerful. That's who we favor. And in every culture, that looks different, but it's the same impulse. We tend to favor the faces of those who look like us and are like us and those who are in positions of power and influence. Let me read verse 5. James says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? This is amazing. He's pointing out the fact that the whole story of the gospel from Genesis onward is a story of God choosing the, those that the world does not favor. This is how it's always been. He chooses Abram uh, uh, from Ur of the Chaldeans to become Abraham, the father of many. He chooses David, the youngest of the, of, of the, of the brothers of Jesse, to, to be the greatest king. He chooses a peasant girl to be the mother of God. Over and over again, God chooses those the world does not favor. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, let me read this for you. The apostle Paul reminds the Corinthian church, he says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth, meaning you weren't the favored in the society. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. I can't read that passage the same way in the wake of the events of these last couple of weeks. Since the killing of George Floyd and the racial protests and unrest in our country, I read that differently. I hope you do as well. Let me just give you three reasons why showing favoritism, receiving the face of certain people and not others, is a complete contradiction to our faith. Three reasons. First, it runs counter to the character of God. It runs counter to the character of God. Now, I've always assumed that, you know, the favoritism is just having some, you know, a few fr friends you like better. That's not true. That's not what James is talking about. I've also assumed that, you know, in the antidote to favoritism is just to be neutral, to treat everybody the same. You know, we're all the same. Everybody should be equal. We hear th people say things like, I don't see color. I don't make distinctions. All people are treated the same. That's not actually how the Bible frames it. Let me read to you from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Good. Just stay neutral, God. Verse 18, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Are you catching that? This, if you're paying attention, you ought to go, wait a second. Verse, eight, verse 17, God shows no partiality. That's the word. That's the word for receive the face of. He's not, he's, he accepts everyone the same. So right after telling us that God play, does not play favorites, verse 18 tells us who God favors. What? Who does he favor? Widows, immigrants, poor, fatherless, those that the society rejects and pushes aside. And then in verse 19, we must do the same. From the Old Testament to the New. Right after saying God doesn't play favorites, it tells us who God favors. How does this work? Now, we want to say God is impartial and that every life matters equally and that at one level, of course, that's true. That is true. 
But what's also true is that God shows special favor toward those that are not favored in the world. This, if you want to know why I wrestled with mowing the, when I was mowing the lawn about this sermon, this is why. Because I know some of you are, are getting antsy right now. Some of you are wondering where this is going. But let me just tell you, this is not a political statement. Christians can agree that there's issues in our country and disagree about the solutions. This is not a political statement. It's a profoundly biblical one. I have no interest in being political, but I've given my life to trying to be biblical and to help us to be as well. Uh, Pastor Glenn Packiam says, the opposite of favoritism is not neutrality. It is the tilting of favor toward those who have been pushed down, those whom God favors. Let me say that again. The opposite of favor is not neutrality. It is the tilting of favor toward those that have been pushed down. Now, staying neutral would be fine and right if we still lived in the Garden of Eden. If we still lived in the Garden, that'd be the right thing to do. But we don't live there. We live east of Eden. We live in a broken world, a world full of oppression, full of injustice, that is the ultimate compounding product of human sin operating in our hearts and in the systems of the world. And because we live in a broken and unjust world where some people are oppressed and pushed aside, we, God's people, are called to reflect God's heart and work to change that. That's exactly what James is saying here. I recently heard one pastor say that quarantine has not been the great leveler or uniter in our country, but it's been the great revealer. Now, I agree, it's not been the, even though we have like hashtag all in this together, right? You know, I, I look on social media and I see some of the celebrities. I saw one celebrity who, who was saying that they had spent quarantine in an in a, in a Irish castle. And it's been like a fairy tale. I'm like, hashtag all in this together. You know, that's not my experience. Maybe it's not yours either. But quarantine has been the great revealer. It has revealed that some people are disproportionately affected by it. Some of you have not had the luxury of working from home and worried about your Zoom background. You've actually had to go into work. And in some, first, in some cases, working on the front lines and putting yourself at risk. That's real. And some people have not had the luxury of working at all because you're underemployed or unemployed as a result of COVID-19 and the economic fallout. It has not affected all of us the same. And it has also revealed that there are issues of division and injustice in our nation that existed long before COVID-19 came along racial tension and oppression and violence. Now, I know that this subject is so highly charged and so politicized in our culture that you almost can't talk about it for fear of being offend, offending someone, being labeled politically, being dismissed. And again, I have no desire to be political, but I want us to be biblical. And sometimes that means we have to, we have to pull back the, the lenses through which we look at the world and ask God, show me what I'm missing here. Let me just put it this way. When we speak, when I speak, when you speak, when we as God's people speak up for and act on behalf of the rights of the marginalized and the disenfranchised and oppressed, we are not being politically divisive. We are being united to the heart of God. Think of it this way. If God's face is favoring the poor and the oppressed in a society, and it clearly is, that's undeniable in Scripture, then what does it say about us if we turn our face the opposite way? If God's face is looking this way, saying, I favor these people, I care about their situation, and we as the church turn our face the opposite direction, what does it say about us? It says we're not, we, are, we do not have God's heart. We need to grow. Now again, don't misunderstand. There's no political party that gets this right. This is the problem in our culture. Automatically, we begin to take sides and we begin to feel like we're divided on this issue. And I want to, whatever side of the aisle you're on right now, I just want to call you to lay that aside because God cares deeply and is passionate about the rights and the protection of the racial minorities in our country. God cares deeply about the rights and the protection of the unborn. God cares deeply about the rights and protection and justice for children who are trafficked. God cares deeply about the rights and protection of exploited workers. Which political party puts all those together perfectly? There isn't one, but the gospel does. And you and I must resist being partisan, being, being identified one way or the other. We must 
put our focus and our minds on what the God's word teaches and say, God, what are you calling me to do? That's, I think, what James is saying to this group here. You're getting this wrong. You're acting like the world. This brings us to the second reason that showing favoritism is a contradiction to our faith. It falls short of our calling as his people. It runs contrary to God's character. It falls short of our calling as his people. Let me read verses 8 and 9 for you. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. What he's saying here is that um, I, heard, I heard Derek Kidner is an Old Testament commentator, and I read his comment, not on this passage, but he's saying essentially the law of God, God's teaching in Scripture, is not a pile of rocks where I moved, I got most of them on, on one side. I moved most of the rocks, and I, you know, I might have forgot a rock or two, a pebble or two, but I got most of the rocks in order. He said it's much better to think of it as a mirror which reflects the goodness of God in the world. So if there's a crack in the mirror, the whole image is distorted. That's what James is saying. It's not like, I got most of the rocks, oh, I forgot that one. In other words, we don't get to pick and choose which parts of God's law we like and which ones we're going to sideline. Our life is to, by the God's power and his spirit's work, to bring all of ourselves under the authority of God's word. All of ourselves, all of our lives, under all of what his word says. That's profoundly difficult. I struggle. You struggle. None of us are there yet. But that's what we're called to. Because if we ignore part of it, that's a, a broken mirror. It's, it's damaging the image of God to be reflected in the world. Verse 12 James 2, 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That's our calling. Speak and act as those who are judged by the law that's going to give freedom, meaning the law of freedom. What's the law of freedom? Well, it, it's the law of love. It's what we just spent seven weeks studying, 1 Corinthians 13. It's asking ourselves the question, what does love require of me? Speak and act like people who are serious about that question. And many of us are asking, well, what does it require of me? What should I do? What should I say? You know, I think in this cultural moment, we are learning from our younger generation. I know that I am. And I learned even from my own son, who's a college graduate a year and a half ago, and he still keeps in touch with his, he lived in a house with a group of teammates on the football team, and, and they lived together in this home. And they had a great experience. And recently they had a Zoom call because there's, there was, there were, it was a racially mixed house as the team was. And they got on a Zoom call together to talk about what's going on in our country and how they each felt about it. And I asked for permission to share the story without names, but my son told me that they had a chance to pray for each other, pour out their hearts, ask questions, and that one white player and housemate asked one of the black players and housemates, what should I do? What should I do? And this 23-year-old young black man, my, my son's housemate and teammate, said to this other player, I can't tell you that. It means the world that you asked, but I can't tell you that. You know your heart. You know your own spiritual gifts. You know where you're placed. You know God's word. You're going to have to sort that out. I thought, what a wise answer from a young man. Our culture is saying, if you don't say this, if you don't do this this way, then you're a bigot and hateful. That's not true. You're going to have to take seriously the call of God's word on your life. You're going to have to wrestle that through, and I'm going to have to do it, and we're going to have to do it. The final reason that showing favoritism is a contradiction to our faith. It ignores our own need for God's mercy. It ignores our own need for God's mercy. The real issue James is pointing out is that the, the, the people in this church, the church in, in, in the world, had favored the rich because they had judged the poor. Let me read verse 13 for you. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now it sounds like James is, I'm sorry, James, what? Are you changing the subject? I thought we were talking about favoritism. Now he's talking about judgment. They go together. Here's what he's saying. He's pointing out something very, very easy for us to miss. There was a distortion of Jewish teaching that viewed the people that were rich as favored by God and people that were poor or if they had uh, sickness or, or, or born with some issue that they were um, unfavored by God or they were sinful or worse, they were cursed. And of course, we would never think this way in our culture. We would never behave this way. No, except we do. We do. 
You drive through a neighborhood and think, wow, what a sketchy place that is. They need to stop acting like that. They've made better decisions. He just needs to stop complaining and start working. We, we judge. And James is saying, your favoritism is based on your judge, the judgments in your heart, and the judgments of your heart are not just. They're wicked. They're wrong. He's trying to point that out. To us as well. And we all do it. We may not say it, but we think of these reasons for why someone else is suffering. We justify, we rationalize why this is going on. And God says, I think, to us right now, you do not want to play that game. <laughs> you don't want to go there. Think of it, if God had looked down from his throne in heaven at all of our behaviors and said, those people need to stop acting that way. They need to clean up their act and get themselves together. Look at the terrible choices they're making. This is the mess they've made. He has every right to say that. Instead, he comes to us. He incarnates himself. In fact, he lays aside his privilege and his rights and comes into our world as one of us to suffer and die in our place, to redeem us, to restore us, to forgive, to cleanse, and to usher in his kingdom. Because in the end, James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. When you and I recognize our own need for God's mercy, how far we fall short of his standard. And I'll be honest, I only had two days to work on this, but over those two days, since Friday afternoon, that's what I've been wrestling with, how far I fall short. How easily it is for me to rationalize and justify and the question, what does love require of me? You know why I often don't answer that the right way or the way that I think God wants me to? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of offending someone. I'm afraid of how it might look. I'm afraid of what it might, what it, what it might cause, what it might cost. I fall short, and I know that you do too. And mercy triumphs over judgment, not when we get it right, but when we recognize we're getting it wrong and we need his mercy. And then when that happens, when you get that, what happens to us then is I no longer need to pass judgment and to exclude. God in his mercy, turns his face to those who, because of sin, are on the outside. And that, friends, is every one of us. It's all of us. And when you see his face looking at you with favor and love because of Jesus, then he wants you to turn your face to the outcasts, to the outsiders, to those that the world dismisses and discards. That's what the church is called to do. What a perfect way to illustrate, for us to illustrate that, than by coming to his table. We're going to do that virtually, of course. You're in your own homes. But if you have your elements ready, I want you to get them ready as I pray. Because when we, what the table really is, is a place where we celebrate what James says here at the end of verse 13, mercy triumphing over judgment. You and I deserve judgment, but God has given us mercy and grace. Let's pray. Father God, we humbly come before you acknowledging that we fall short of your righteous standard. We are all lawbreakers. We're all guilty of all of it. None of us, not, despite the color of our skin, our political ideologies, our family of origin, our education, our economic background, none of that matters. The ground is level at the foot of your cross. All of us are lawbreakers and all of us are in need of mercy. And we praise you that you give mercy to us through your son Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection. Speak to our hearts now as we prepare bread and cup to remember your sacrifice, Lord, the price you paid for your mercy to triumph. In Jesus' name, amen.